we have assembled ourselves together for the most solemn phase of our worship service, the Lord's Table. We now have the opportunity of recognizing the communion service as having a greater impact in our spiritual lives as ever before. Communion is a test of our love for God, which is the key to why communion was ordained in the first place. This is why this is so that we might recognize that everything was accomplished by the integrity of God in eternity past and in which he took our Lord in hypostatic union to the cross. Communion is a test of our love for God as listed in 1 John chapter 4 verse 19 where it says we love because he first loved us. This is the concept of reciprocity. We love God because he first loved us. The bread, which we will pass out, represents our Lord in hypostatic union and the integrity that came from his unique spiritual life and how it took him to the cross. He endured the, the cross, despising the shame, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. The bread represents the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cup represents the salvation work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Beyond that, it represents the unique spiritual life, the post-salvation life, in which it describes blessings that are far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. The ritual of eating and drinking is the principle of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's because anyone, evil or good, can eat or drink. And it represents a non-meritorious action of eating and drinking, such as faith alone in Christ alone, which is a non-meritorious action. Also, there is an emphasis on the rebound technique, which is 1 John 1, 9. For there is a warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in which if you do not rebound, that is, name your sins to God before partaking of the elements, you are definitely under liability for punishment from God in three categories. First of all, we have warning discipline. Secondly, intensive discipline. And thirdly, dying discipline. And that's why many in the Corinthian church ended up dead because they did not rebound during their taking of the communion and they made a big hullabaloo out of it, more like a party than it was a serious, solemn event in which it is, it is a test of your love for God. And whom the Lord loves, he punishes, and that's the principle that we find with communion. God has mandated that all of us as church age believers observe communion, the only ritual that is still in existence today, that is the communion table. 1 Corinthians 11:24 says this, keep on doing this in memory of me. That's why we have communion, to remember our Lord Jesus Christ and all the work that he accomplished on the cross. In preparation, therefore, for taking this examination, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving all of you the option to name your sins to God if necessary. Therefore, uh, let us pray. Father, we are grateful that in eternity past, you knew all about us. You knew all about our successes and our failures, and you understood and knew us long before we ever existed. Therefore, we have the opportunity to learn about you and all the work of Christ on the cross and what it means to our eternal status. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to meditate upon these things as we are mandated to do as part of our worship service. We ask these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Now I'll have uh, Brad pass out the bread. And it is our custom to re retain the bread until all have been served. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior 
and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement, chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his bruise we are drawn together. For all we are like sheep and have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Lord made a very solemn and important statement. He said, This is, this is my body, which is given as a substitute for you. Our Lord also said, take this bread and eat it. So take all of you and eat. We are greatly heavenly Fa we are grateful heavenly Father for remembering you through the cup. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will make this very real to us and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So now we will uh, pass around the element of the cup. It is our custom to retain the cup until all have been served. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory. We have not been redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our empty manner of life, but by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord took the cup, saying, This represents the new covenant of my blood. Drink ye all of it. Now we will sing, uh, Let Us Survey the Wondrous Cross. So all of us, please stand as we sing. It's on page 13. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, from his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love 
love and sorrow me or thorns compose so rich a crown were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all father we thank you for the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich for our sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might become rich we pray this in the name of the king of kings and lord of lords even jesus christ our savior amen turn in your bibles to matthew chapter 12 verse 22 matthew chapter 12 verse 22 then they brought him then they brought to him a demon possessed man who was blind and mute jesus removed the demon so that he could speak and see Jesus removed this demon and then he continued on el continued his ministry on elsewhere that is the indication from the original languages then in 1223 all the crowds were amazed and kept saying could this one be the son of David many of them were contemplating whether they should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or not they were contemplating as to whether he was the Messiah that was to come he definitely was and some of them believed most of them did not and that's how it's been all throughout human history then in 1224 but when the Pharisees heard this they said he does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub Beelzebub is a title of derision for Satan actually meaning the prince of dung and we all know what dung is I don't have to elaborate on that prince of demons prince of dung and that's what they called our Lord Jesus Christ in his perfection. So religion and legalism constantly try to cloud the way of salvation, just as these Pharisees did. Our Lord had just made it very clear from prophecy and everything else that he is the Messiah. And now the Pharisees, the legalists, and the religious crowd get up and say, oh, he does these things from Beelzebub and he is Beelzebub is what they were saying he is the prince of dung and that's what they called our Lord the perfection of our Lord and that should about make your skin crawl especially after having communion in which we uh, well we respect our Lord and remember him for all that he did for us on the cross yet they called him Beelzebub and they also called uh, John the baptizer from Satan as well so remember it doesn't have to do with personality or lifestyle John the baptizer came not eating and drinking that is not eating those things that would offend others and not drinking wine or anything else that would offend the religious crowd and our Lord came eating and drinking and they called them both Beelzebub Prince of Dung so you cannot uh, compromise with these people they are in what is called the cosmic system they will always be in conflict with those of us who are growing in grace and in knowledge and it was so then it is so now after all if they called our Lord the Prince of Dung how much more will they call us just dung and they do and that's the way they think of uh, spiritual lives it, well it's a battle a satanic battle between growing in grace and in knowledge and living within Satan's cosmic system and there's always a battle there and that's why our Lord said he came to bring a sword so a sword is between those who grow in grace and those who go in the cosmic system now if you decide to go into the cosmic system the sword is removed you become part of them and you attack those growing in grace but you will go either those you can't be in between you're either gonna go for the Word of God or against it and just as our president said after 9-11 he said you're either with us or against us in other words join us in this battle against terror and if you don't 
you're against us. And the same holds true now. Join the Lord, and that is join Him in the unique spiritual life. Join Him in living the protocol, whereas He lived the prototype. Or join Satan's system. It's a choice that is very clear. There's no gray area. And you can't say, well, I'll just uh, walk the fence. It doesn't work that way. You either go for the spiritual life or you go for the cosmic system. No in between. There can't be. Never has been. No personality can even overcome this sword. No personality of sweetness and light can overcome this sword. Remember John the Baptizer, a personality that uh, most of the religious crowd would love today. Never ever touched a drink. He could even get up and give that testimony. I never touched wine, he could say. And he could say, I never overate. I never did any of those things. Never touched a cigarette. Never did anything like that. Yet they still criticized him. There is no compromise. And they will attack you no matter what. And you might lower yourselves to their, to their level and try to take up their phony uh, vocabulary and say, God willing, God bless you and all of that. It's still not going to work. They're still going to hate you. That is, if you're living your spiritual life. But if you lower yourselves to their level, it indicates that you've become a weak sister and you're just going to follow them because they're your friends. Well, don't let your friends take your crown. They're not that important. Our Lord is far more important than any friendship we could ever have. And I've lost friends because of my spiritual life. I've lost what I thought were good friends because of my spiritual life. I lost one because he was an unbeliever and I lost another because he was an incarnality. He, was, he is a believer as far as I know and he's going to heaven. But uh, he, 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 there was a conflict, a sword there. Well, so what? Pal around with him or have blessings untold? I go with blessings untold. Now you have to ask yourself a question, which way do you go? Now that doesn't mean you can't have friends and you can't get freaky about it and get weird and say, I won't associate with so-and-so and so-and-so, and so, although it might be wise sometimes. You have to live normally. You're in the world. You're not of it, but you're in it. So, But uh, never, the, the principle is, love uh, Jesus Christ, love God the Father more than your friends. And we see this from the Pharisees. The fact that they attacked our Lord so much, all the time. Then in 1225, and being aware of what they thought, this indicates he had great perception. He wasn't aware of these things from his deity, although he uh, could have used his deity and been aware very easily and simply. But remember the doctrine of kenosis, he did not use his deity to interfere with his humanity. He knew this from his humanity. He knew this from uh, having discernment from the word of God. And he knew what they were saying about him. It's, he's had it said about him for years now. So he's really, he's just looking out. He just knows what they think by the looks on their faces, by the things that they whisper. He knows about what they're going to say. So being aware of what they thought, not because he's God, but because he had discernment from his humanity. He said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is destroyed. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. So he makes this statement in the midst of them trying to run him down. And they say, oh, he's from Beelzebub. He is from the devil. If he's not the devil himself. And they said these things. But our Lord is casting out demons. So he says, well, if I am the devil and I'm casting out demons, that means I'm div divided against myself. And no kingdom divided against itself can stand. Well, this shocked them, but you have to put yourself in the shoes of the Pharisees. Pharisees. It shocked them because, well, they didn't have a clue that he knew what they were thinking. And then when he comes up with this statement out of the blue, you, you can see he's almost just changing the subject. And, well, he catches them in their gossip, maligning, and judging. And they are shocked. They don't like that at all. And he continues, and he will continue for the next few passages. 1226. 1226. So, let's assume that Satan cast out Satan. That is, so for the sake of argument. So for the sake of argument, let's assume that Satan cast out Satan. Our Lord's using a debater's technique. He's very good at it, of course. 
Let's assume that Satan cast out Satan. He is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? They're accusing him of being Satan. And he comes right out and says, How will Satan's kingdom stand if it's divided against itself? And actually, Satan's kingdom is divided against itself. But this is a type of double entendre. There's a double meaning here. He's saying, I'm not Satan. And uh, Satan is divided against himself. And his kingdom will fall. And Satan is divided against himself. Because if you go to a Pentecostal church and they're exercising people and they're uh, trying to heal people by bopping them on the head and all of that nonsense, a lot of times there's Satan involved in that. But he's using the name of Christ. He's divided against himself. Satan always is. His kingdom will fall. It's a double entendre in which he's saying, I'm not Satan, but he is, and his kingdom will fall. And this shocked them all because uh, they didn't expect our Lord would know what they were saying behind his back. But he knew he had probably heard it several times before. It wouldn't take a rocket scientist to know what religious people are going to say about you. And if you've been around them long enough, or if you've been living the spiritual life long enough, you're going to know that when you come across a religious or a legalistic person, they're going to talk about you. They're going to make up lies about you. They're going to make up lies about the person you listen to. And they will destroy or attempt to destroy your character. Well, that's the nature of Satan's system. And that is the way it works. And so when he was saying this, he was letting them know, he was letting them know this. He was saying, I know what you're saying about me, but let me use a little common sense. He was actually using a logical progression. He was actually using a debater's technique. And he was saying to them, You say about me that I'm of Satan? Well, if I cast out demons, that means Satan is divided against himself and his kingdom's going to fall. Well, he brought it right back on them and all the people that had heard that vitriolic lie stood up and took notice. And they said, You know, this man's right. He's not trying to hide anything. Then in 12, 27. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Now, what does this mean? By whom do your sons? Now, all the prophets in the past had cast out demons. This is what it means. All the prophets in the past had uh, performed some types of miracles in the Old Testament, some of them cast out demons. Some of them, like Elijah, would raise people from the dead. Some of them would do these things and they would teach these things in the synagogues. And they would say, Elijah took that poor woman's young son and rose him from the dead. And then they would preach about Moses who turned the, uh, uh, the river into blood, the Nile into blood. And they would talk about all the miracles that the prophets in the past had done. And so what he's bringing up to them is he's saying if you uh, if you don't think I if you think I'm doing it by Satan then how did they do it? How did Moses do it? How did Elijah do it? How did all the prophets in the past do it? Are you saying they did it by Satan as well? He was really insulting them, not insulting them, just bringing them common sense, but they took it as an insult instead of listening and saying, you know, you're right. We always taught that in the synagogue. We always got up in the synagogue and talked about the prophets. And we talked about how they did this and this in terms of miracles. And they would say to themselves, if they were objective, so this man comes along and does the same things. Why don't we take another look at him? That is, if they were objective, but they weren't. They had another type of system working with them. They were jealous. They were jealous of our Lord. They were scared He was going to take away their ministry because He just walked right up into their synagogue, start healing people. They got terrified they were going to lose their ministry. Well, their ministry was useless anyway. And if they had been objective, they could have said, we've been wrong this whole time. He's the Son of God. And then they could have worked with Him instead of against Him. But they were against Him. And then he says, therefore, they will be your judges. That is the prophets of the past. He's trying to shock them. He's trying to shock them into saying, uh, you don't believe me? If you don't believe me, it's just as if you don't believe Moses and Elijah. And they don't. They say they do, but they don't. So if they don't believe Christ, they don't believe Moses and Elijah. He's the mediator. 
the mediator between man and God. And if you don't believe in Christ, then all of those stories about Elijah and all of that are useless to you and you're still going to hell. So they will be your judges. Because you know, you know why they will be their judges? Because when they go to the last judgment, they will get up and Jesus Christ will confront them and they will say, but we taught about Moses and Elijah. And he will say, I never knew you. And cast them into the lake of fire. Moses and Elijah will be their judge. It was all human good for them to talk about Moses and Elijah. Had no spiritual value for them whatsoever. They were unbelievers. 1228. But because I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, that's God the Holy Spirit. That is how our Lord cast out demons using the filling of God the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God has come upon you. So right now they're very shocked. And that shock will soon translate into seething rage. You see, shock could have done two things to them. First of all, they could have been shocked so much that they would say, let me think about it. Let me mull it over in my mind and see how this works out. And if they had been objective enough and not arrogant, they would have come to realize that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But instead, they, they were shocked in another way. And this time, they were shocked so they just... Uh, well, they translated into rage. They became angry, very angry toward our Lord. Now, I don't know what your Bible says, but the word is shocked. That is the word. It may say amazed or something else. But the word is shocked from the Greek and also the old Aramaic, but it was also translated into Greek. Uh, but this has to do with something earlier that they were shocked. Now, in 1229 or else... How can someone entering a strong man's house? Now this is a house that is well fortified. It doesn't mean the man is 300 pounds with a lot of muscles. A strong man's house. Well, it would be like entering a my house where I have a shotgun and a pistol ready for anyone. <laughs> or probably like entering a, your house or going into Zach's bedroom or somewhere else where he has a, a, a bunch of guns. You know, just blow them away. Well, that's a strong man's house. It's well defended. Or else, how can someone enter a strong man's house? The house refers to the devil's world. And that is a strong man's house, by the way. The cosmic system of the devil's world. And carry off his property. Unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can thoroughly plunder his house. So first, uh, maybe the guy's asleep, he sneaks in, ties him up, he, then he can't get a hold of his weapons, and that's the only way you can take over a strong man's house, is to tie him up. So you could almost make application from this that our Lord is for ownership of guns in your homes. Well, he was, he was for you to have a, a strong man's house. In other words, protect your property. And he was all for private property. He, he instituted private property. And if you blow some away, someone away for coming into your house, well, then you're doing a good thing, not a bad thing, no matter what anyone says. You're protecting your family. Now, I got off subject. This isn't really what our Lord's talking about, but we can make some application from it. This is a reference to our Lord having the power to cast out demons. This is what it means. He has the power to cast out demons from God the Holy Spirit. He has the power to tie up the strong man, Satan's cosmic system. He has the power to tie up Satan. He has the power to tie up Satan's house. Therefore, he has the power to cast demons out by means of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on and says in 1230, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Gathering with the Lord means through evangelism. And all of us are commanded to witness, by the way. But make sure that when you witness, you know what you're talking about. Make sure you know all the verses related to it. Make sure that you know, know John 3.15, John 3.18, John 3.36, Acts 16.31a. Make sure you know all of the passages related to uh, salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. And don't get them confused with other passages that deal with the unique spiritual life, such as 1 John 1. Nine. Never tell someone who is uh, who with whom you are witnessing to, never tell them to name their sins to God. That's for the believer only. They don't name their sins to God for salvation. They believe in Christ. 
And that's a misinterpretation of Scripture. Something very easy to do for someone who is a, a, a childhood believer. Nothing to feel ashamed about. You've got time to grow up. And then when you grow up, you can uh, give these things straight. And so, through evangelism. Now, all of us, when we grow in grace and in knowledge, will have opportunities to evangelize. We'll come, come across people who are unbelievers, and we will have every opportunity in the world to give them the gospel. But don't do that until you know the gospel. And as long as you've been with me, most of you should know it by now. And if you uh, still feel a little skittish about it, then memorize some passages like John 3.15, John 3.16, John 3.18, John 3.36, John 6.47, John 11.25, John 11.26, and a whole bunch more that I'm not going to give you uh, for the sake of uh, the fact that it won't look like I'm bragging. I'm not. I'm just telling you something. Besides, I got this from someone else anyway, so it doesn't matter. And it just matters is, do you get it out? Get out the gospel if you know it. And if you don't, you scatter, and that is you haven't uh, uh, given much attention to the spiritual life. But remember, the spiritual life is first, production is second. First of all comes spiritual life, grow in grace and in knowledge. Secondly, as a result, you will witness, and you will follow your uh, divine spiritual gift, whatever that may be. So this is an indication of uh, no true love for the Lord uh, due to the disciples' lack of spiritual growth. And this is, he's almost castigating the disciples by saying, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. The disciples up until this point have do been doing very little gathering. If anything, remember when our Lord goes to the cross, what happens to all these disciples? They scatter. They didn't have enough spiritual growth. They didn't have the filling of God and the Holy Spirit either because they didn't ask for it. So they scattered to the wind. Later they came back together once they started to grow in grace and in knowledge. And people like Peter became martyrs. And a lot of the other disciples went a long way in their spiritual life. So just uh, think, if you're having a hard time sometimes, just think. The disciples did too. And they were right there with the Lord. And they were knuckleheads sometimes. But who, who isn't? A knucklehead sometimes, me included. We all are. And it takes a lot of discipline, it takes a lot of uh, testing, and it takes a... Well, what it really takes is a lot of exposure to the Word of God, Operation Z, and the filling of God the Holy Spirit. With that, you can accomplish anything. Then in uh, 12, 31, For this reason I keep on telling you. This is the way it comes out in the Greek. He didn't, he didn't just tell it to them once. He kept on telling it to them over and over again. Repetition. And they definitely needed it because they didn't have the filling of God the Holy Spirit to bring to their memory those things they had forgotten. And that is what we have. They didn't have it because they didn't ask for it. For this reason I keep telling you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven mankind. Now, he kept on telling them this because a lot of them had a little bit of a problem starting out with eternal security. As a lot of people do starting out. They had a problem with it. And so he kept on telling them, everything's forgiven. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. Now, there's an audience there outside of the disciples, and that is the religious crowd. And he's about to make a point to the religious crowd, and at the same time make a point to the disciples that he had been making for a long time. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven mankind. You know what that means? Peter denied Christ three times. He was forgiven for that. And a lot of people say, well, if you go out and deny Christ, then you've just uh, forsaken your salvation. Peter did it three times and he's got eternal rewards that most of us will never see. And our Lord prophesied that he would deny him three times. But in that prophecy, he didn't say, Peter, you're about to make a mistake. Peter, you're about to deny me three times, therefore you're in danger of hell. He never said that because he never was in danger of hell. So if anybody comes to you and says, well, if you deny him after you've believed, you lose your salvation, that's nonsense. I've known believers who have eventually denied Christ once they got deep enough into the cosmic system. They're still saved. You wouldn't know it if you talked to them today. They might talk to you about Buddhism or something else, but they're still saved and they're still going to heaven. That's the grace of God. They believed at one point 
and in the Greek, the word, uh, the, the word for faith, as in John 3.16, when you believe, it's a one-time thing. Look, if Jesus cried once, if, if Jesus Christ died once and for all, we believe once and for all. For us to say we could lose our salvation, that means that we are hanging Christ on the cross over and over again. He did it once for all. One time. We believe one time and we're saved for all time, all eternity. And there is no way around it. And every scripture in uh, the, the Bible concerning eternal security backs that up 100%. And this verse backs it up by saying every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven mankind. Everything. If they believe in Christ, of course. But then he comes up with a one thing. And that is, but the blasphemy against the Spirit. Now what's that mean? Well, that doesn't mean that if you uh, say something disparagingly against the Spirit, that that's a blasphemy against the Spirit. This is technical. And remember, common grace and efficacious grace, which I've taught you in detail. In common grace, what happens? These spiritually dead Pharisees would come up and listen to the gospel. And God the Holy Spirit was right there. And he would uh, take these Pharisees and grab them by their souls and make them understand it for the first time. And they would for the first time understand that they needed a mediator, that they needed Jesus Christ, and they would actually come to the point of understanding it. That's common grace. But then what did they do? They, they understood it. They say, yes, I hear this and I understand it, but I do not believe it. They rejected the common grace of God the Holy Spirit. And when they rejected the common grace of God the Holy Spirit, they blasphemed against the Spirit. The Spirit let it be known. And then they rejected it. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So the only way to really blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to reject our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know this from the Holy Spirit's function of common and efficacious grace. Now if they had believed in Christ... God the Holy Spirit would make it efficacious. That means effective. And they would have been saved. But they heard it, they understood it, and they said no. That means they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in grace let some of these Pharisees understand the gospel message. In grace. And so when they get to the last judgment... Well, they're not going to have an excuse because uh, God the Father and God the Son will be there and God the Son will say to them, God the Holy Spirit made this understandable to you and you said, No! Therefore, I do not know you. You're going to the lake of fire. And that is where most of these Pharisees will go, although some of them believe. Now, I don't want to lead you astray in any way in something that I said before about uh, Christ being murdered. Christ really wasn't murdered. It was the will of God the Father for him to go to the, to go to the cross. And it was his own volition that let him go through it. And it was his own volition that said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So no one really had the opportunity to murder the Lord. And that's for any anti-Semite who might get up and say, the Jews killed Jesus. No, he voluntarily did all of those things. And it was the Roman Empire, remember, that hung him on the cross. Jewish law wouldn't permit it, and they had to go to Rome for it to happen. So don't ever get that confused with uh, anti-Semitism. We don't believe in that around here. The Jews can believe in Christ just like everyone else. And by the way, those who bless the Jew will be blessed and those who curse the Jew will be cursed. And anti-Semitism, we will study in detail in the future, has bad repercussions both individually and for the country involved in it. Our country hasn't been involved in it that much. But all we have to do is have a change of leadership and we could get deeply involved in it. But right now... We seem to uh, have Israel as our friend, or at least we pretend they're our friend, but uh, we offer enough support now that the, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're blessed. But the overriding factor is always the pivot. And there's still enough people who are interested in the word that our country still survives to this day and hopefully will continue to survive depending on the uh, new generation's attitude toward the word of God. 
So we, and then he says, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And I just told you what that has to do with. It's simple rejection of Christ. You reject Christ, that's not forgiven. And in essence, when you reject Christ, you have blasphemed against the Spirit who let it be understood to you. And that's the only meaning of uh, 1231. And I was asked that a while back by uh, someone a long time ago who attended this church one time, and they said, uh, what does that mean? Well, it's become a point of, uh, well, some pastors get up and teach it, don't even have a clue what they're talking about, but that's exactly what it means, all from uh, theology and everything else brings out the fact that God the Holy Spirit reveals the gospel. And when you reject it, you've rejected what God the Holy Spirit reveals, therefore you've blasphemed against God the Holy Spirit. Then it says in 1232, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. In other words, whoever was there ridiculing Jesus Christ would be forgiven. Whoever was there talking about how he had demons in him and how he was Satan-possessed, they could be forgiven if they would simply believe in Christ, and a lot of them would at a later date. Some of them right then would not do it. And he would go all the way to the cross and it wouldn't be till years later that they would realize that he was the Savior. Then they would believe. So anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, remember Peter did this. Uh, someone went up to Peter, one of the uh, slave girls went up to Peter and said, I know you, you're, you're one of those uh, Christian people. They didn't have the word Christian right then. But they said, you're one of the ones that follow Christ. And he says, no, I don't know him. Then somebody else saw him. And he said, I tell you the truth, I don't know the man. And then a third person saw him and well, he, cussed, he, he began to cuss. And the cussing is not illustrated in Scripture, neither will I illustrate it for you, but you can imagine what he was saying. I don't know the blankety blank, 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 blank. That's something that he said against the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven neither in this age nor the age to come. So that means that it, it's the same principle. If you reject the common grace of God the Holy Spirit and His revelation of the gospel to you, you will not be forgiven. You will go to hell for your rejection of Christ. That's all it means. Now, as an unbeliever, you may have... Uh, uh, to cussed out Jesus Christ on your own uh, on, on several occasions. There's been some nuts that do that. Stand up and say, uh, uh, like in the movie Forrest Gump, where the guy's out there in the hurricane and the waves are slapping over the boat and he stands up on his uh, nub legs or sits down on his nub leg, Lieutenant Dan, and he says, uh, You blankety blank, is that all you got? And then later on the indication was he had peace with God and maybe he believed in Christ. The movie didn't say that. That's Hollywood. Hollywood couldn't come up with something that great. Uh, but uh, you might, uh, just uh, for a point of your own reference, say that even though he cussed out God at one point, he believed in Christ later and he has peace with God. And that is where peace with God comes from. Faith alone in Christ alone. And so, but if you uh, blaspheme against the Spirit and say, I don't believe that, well, you're going to hell. It's simply a rejection of Christ, and it's um, something that's technical, but something that has been very um, misconstrued, and a lot of people have gotten very confused on that point, uh, but you shouldn't be confused now. And then uh, let me make sure I got it. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, neither in this age nor the age to come. That means in all dispensations. And common grace was given in all dispensations. And no matter what dispensation you live in, if you do not uh, believe in Christ, you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit and you will go to hell. And that was the case for every generation and every dispensation. 12.33 Either make the tree good and its fruit good. That means to believe in Jesus Christ and the good fruit of His ministry. Jesus Christ uh, not only uh, produced uh, the salvation message for everyone, but He also produced the good fruit of His ministry in teaching Bible doctrines. So it means that believe in Jesus Christ and believe in the doctrines that He taught. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make a tree corrupt. That is, by rejecting Christ. And its fruit rotten. 
for a tree is known by its fruit. Well, if you reject Christ, this is very simple, what this means. And this is not something for you to uh, go out and try to produce all types of works. If you do so and you're not filled with the Spirit, then you have produced wood, hay, and stubble. This simply means that uh, if you reject Christ, it doesn't matter what you do, your fruit is rotten. Doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how many good deeds you do. Osama bin Laden would go around and build hospitals for the young people and the older people. And he would go around and build schools for the young people in Afghanistan. And all the people praised him like he was a god simply because he did these things. Those are good works, but uh, they are rotten fruit. And we can understand that when we put it on someone like Osama bin Laden because we know he's a rotten man. And a rotten man produces rotten fruit. He's a rotten man because he hasn't believed in Christ. And he produces good deeds which are rotten fruit. And that's the best way I can illustrate it to you to understand it. But there are people around you in the United States who are rotten trees and they produce rotten fruit. They've never believed in Christ, so they're a rotten tree. Therefore, they produce rotten fruit. For a tree is known by its fruit. I should say a corrupt tree. Corrupted, of course, the old sin nature corrupts everyone. And uh, you can only break from that from believing in Christ and then being filled with God the Holy Spirit. And then a lot of believers never break from that. And while they might be a, a, a tree that has been saved, they never produce good fruit. We'll get to that later. But right now, our Lord is talking about the fact that uh, if you're going to produce good fruit, you better be saved. And if you're going to produce rotten fruit, well, you're unsaved. But even saved people can produce rotten fruit. He just didn't delineate that at this point. Then in 1234, well, he's about to get tough again. And he's about to rip these people apart once more again and he says generation of vipers generation of vipers that's what brood of vipers means if that's what your translation says that one even sounds a bit harsher but it's really generation of vipers since you are evil how are you able to say anything good for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart and that means the frontal lobe the stream of consciousness those things that you think will overflow to your mouth so they are filled with mental, a mental attitude of venom toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they're called vipers. Vipers have venom. And they're filled with venom in their souls. And therefore, as a result, come to have verbal sins. Starts out as a mental attitude sin. As a result, they move to verbal sins of gossip, maligning, and judging. Then as a re result of that, this can actually result in the overflow to the overt sin of murder and violence in any form. And these uh, religious, this religious crowd, not all Jews, and don't ever think that. A lot of Jews believed, or some Jews believed in Christ. But the religious crowd, a lot of them never did. And so they, result, they, re, they uh, went toward murder and violence. And they would have done anything to murder our Lord. Then in 1235, the good man brings out good things from the good treasure. This is the true... Tre you know what this means? This means that the true treasure is in your thoughts. He just described bad treasure or evil thoughts as being your mental attitude, what you think in your heart, your stream of consciousness, your frontal lobe, what you think in your brain. So the good man brings out good things from the treasure. That is, the true treasure is in your thoughts. And that dictates your mental attitude. And if you have a positive mental attitude toward the Word of God, and even though you fail, as we all do, but if you continue to grow in grace, your mental attitude will become good, and you will produce good treasure. But if your mental attitude is sour toward the Word of God and say, I don't like it, and you don't even have to go that far. You can say, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't care for it right now. There's a football game on. Or I don't care for it right now. I got something else to be doing. Well, that means your mental attitude has really become rotten. There's nothing more important than the Word of God. And you don't have good treasure in your thoughts if you think something's more important than the Word of God. Now, that is on a daily basis. Some days you might, and then some days you don't. 
And once you start to grow up, it's going to have to be a daily decision, a daily dedication, not a once a Sunday dedication as most places do around here. It doesn't last. You have to do it day by day, day in and day out, learning the Word of God. And that's when you have a mental attitude that produces good treasure. Outside of that, well, you might produce good treasure one day and then be out of fellowship and produce rotten fruit the next. The good man brings out good things from the good treasure that is in his thoughts. And the evil man brings out evil things out of an evil heart. And that has to do with the stream of consciousness. The evil treasure are the evil thoughts, the venom in your soul. And if you're learning the Word of God every day and growing in grace and in knowledge, usually the venom in your soul will go away. It might take time. You see, the venom in your soul is like garbage in the stream of consciousness. And you have to flush that out like a commode would flush certain stuff out. And you have to flush it out through your daily intake of the Word of God. So you might start out with a lot of evil and then you get with the Word of God and it might be half and half. And then eventually, once you get it flushed out, you'll be producing most of the time good treasure. That is your thinking in your uh, mental attitude and in your thoughts. Then in 1236, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every idle word they speak. Now this has to do with any rejection of Christ or any legalistic working for salvation. And you can think of it this way. When you work for salvation, that's actually an idle word. You're working real hard, but it's idle. It's not taking you anywhere. In fact, it's making you uh, more indebted. And the more people work for salvation, the farther away they get from it. Remember that from Romans. It's counted to them as debt. Every time you work for salvation, it's counted to you as debt. You get even farther and farther away, and that has to do with scar tissue on the soul. And the more you work for it, the more scar tissue you put on your soul. And in fact, Esau worked so hard for it his whole life, he never could come around to receive it. And he even wept tears of repentance. Which means... Uh, he wept tears, it says, he wept tears, but he could not come to repentance. That means a change of mind. And you say, but I thought repentance mean to cry. No, it means to change your mind. And that's one of the verses that makes it very clear that repentance has lost its meaning somewhere. Because if you were, I said this to a religious person or a legalistic person one time, I said, uh, look, you think you're saved by this and this? Esau wept for salvation and he could not come to repentance. And he had always thought repentance was reaping at an altar. He always thought repentance was doing something by himself. He was wrong. And when he heard that verse, he looked shocked, just like a lot of these religious people look shocked. So, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every idle word they speak and that means they've rejected Christ, and that means every human good they've ever produced is idle. They think they've worked real hard for it, but human good is idle. It has no purpose, no meaning, and it definitely does not save them. And we see this. This is actually something that comes up. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 20, verse 12. Matthew 12, 36, where it says, I tell you on the day of judgment... People will give an account for every idle word they speak. This is human good. This is all the production that they ever produced as unsaved people trying to be saved. And you can't be saved by your works. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't work your way into heaven. And we see this from Revelation 20, verse 12. And this is actually exactly what our Lord was saying to this religious crowd. And I saw the dead, the great and the small. This deals with the last judgment, the same judgment he's talking about in 1236. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Then books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of life. So the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to their deeds. What does that mean? 
Now you might have some uh, average person off the street read that and say, that means I am judged on the basis of the fact whether I was good or bad, and if I was good I go to heaven, and if I was bad I don't. It means the opposite of that. It doesn't mean that at all. Judged on their deeds, meaning their good deeds does not equal the righteousness of God. Only faith alone in Christ alone will let you have righteousness. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was a credit to him for righteousness. What gave him righteousness? Himself? No, the Lord. Believing in the Lord. And so anything outside of that is minus righteousness. Any good deed that you produce, all these good deeds that you produce to try to get into heaven, Osama bin Laden, all will be counted as uh, nothing. And you will go to hell. And he will, unless he believes in Christ, which I doubt, but he might. I doubt it. But that's up to volition, see? We never do really know what people are going to do. If he's not dead already, I hope to God he is. But if he's not, well, he's destined for hell. So, and I saw the dead, the great and the small. That means uh, presidents, leaders, pharaohs will walk up before the Lord. And the small... That means uh, just a, a janitors, whatever that we consider small in life. Standing before the throne, the books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of life. So the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to their deeds. Now this dead has to do with spiritually dead, of course. They wouldn't be in hell if they weren't spiritually dead. This is the last judgment for unbelievers only, not for us. We will be judged on the basis of our deeds when? Does anybody know? The Bema. That is when we are evaluated on the basis of our human good. And why? Because human good was never judged on the cross. Never. But we will be judged on the basis of our human good at the Bema. And if we've spent our entire life in carnality, functioning in the energy of the flesh, and we go up to heaven... Then our Lord at the Bema will say, what would you do with the unique spiritual life? And if you say, I held up abortion signs, you will be a loser and you won't receive anything. That was energy of the flesh. Had nothing to do with spiritual life. Nothing. Not even close. So you'll be ashamed. Not you per se, but those who don't get with the spiritual life. You here shouldn't be ashamed. You're getting the correct doctrine. And I'm not talking about you when I say you. I'm talking about you as in those people who aren't here. And not even if they're not here, they might listen. I'm talking about the greater area, the, the, the whole nation, as it were, of believers. Many of them believers will be judged on the basis, evaluated at that time. That's what uh, Bema is, evaluation, not judgment. And they will be evaluated on the basis of human good. So will the unbeliever be evaluated on human good. And for the unbeliever, they, uh, God will, or Jesus Christ will say, your righteousness does not equal God's righteousness. Bye-bye, you go to hell. And for the believer who has believed, well, he had the righteousness. So he's there in uh, the uh, resurrection body before our Lord. And then he says, what would you do with the spiritual life? And the only thing he'll be able to offer up is human good. Human good this, human good that. I fed the poor, I did this and that. Well, if you fed the poor and you were filled with God the Holy Spirit, that would be credited as a, a divine good. But if you weren't filled with God the Holy Spirit, it's all human good. And it will be evaluated and it will be burned. And as Peter talks about it, he says for those people who are just uh, arriving into heaven or uh, arriving at the Bema, they are arriving as if they were singed with fire because they never produced anything but human good. So when they get to heaven, it's as if their eyebrows have been burnt off. They came through the fire. You see, the fire is the human good which will be burned. It will be a great bonfire that all of us will get to see. And our own little human goods, mine included, will be in that great bonfire and we'll get to watch it. But the problem is many of us will uh, never have produced any divine good. It would be all human good. And we trounce into heaven as if we were escaping through fire. But we'll be there and you'll be happy to be there. Uh, but you won't have any reward. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, 
Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity and privilege to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May we come to understand what grace is all about, and may we come to understand that we have a purpose that is far higher than what we would ever imagine or think, and that we must grow in grace and in knowledge in order to glorify you and so that we might produce good of intrinsic value. And that good of intrinsic value, Father, as we know, is the good that is uh, developed under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and living inside your unique spiritual life. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.